Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Subtropical Cities Conference 2011. My name's Rosie Kennedy. I'm from um, the Centre for Subtropical Design at the Queensland University of Technology, Brisbane, Australia. And um, it's great to see people, uh, local people here, but also visitors from all over. I know that uh, one of our colleagues from Australia um, has actually travelled from the centre point of the universe to get here. He could, either, he could go in either direction, east or west, and it would still take him at least 30 hours to get here. And that's Philip, who you'll hear from later on in the, um, in the session. Um, I'll uh, introduce our keynote soon. I just wanted to recap a little bit um, from John Todd's wonderful uh, introductory key keynote yesterday, um, where he gave us some optimism, talked about the transformative power of um, um, the uh, ingenuity and innovation of designers, and particularly when we collaborate, um, not just with people from our own disciplines, but um, throughout um, the disciplines of uh, social science and uh, science. So the transformative power of design, I think, is very exciting. Um, just before I introduce Peter, I want to remind you that um, the conference has a wonderful innovations cafe down at um, Conference HQ. And we have some... Um, wonderful exhibitors there and it would be great to engage with them throughout the conference over the next few days and um, and also to, to keep an eye on and participate in um, development of the declaration um, from Subtropical Cities 2011. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Mr Peter Richards and uh, Peter's a, an adjunct professor at the School of Design at uh, QUT in Brisbane. He's also the principal of a, a very well-known and highly respected urban design and architecture practice called Dikey Richards. Uh, they've been involved, uh, particularly Peter, in um, uh, community projects and um, a very large scale community design, um, housing all over Australia, town centres. Peter will tell you more about that himself. Peter's also very um, highly respected but well, uh, well recognised for his expertise in uh, collaborative design methods and uh, community engagement. He combines his practice with research and regularly contributes to conferences and publications. Recent publications include um, Suburban Urbanism and a Transect for Urban Settlement Types. And uh, we'll just get some more information from Peter later about where, where um, you can um, get those publications. So underscoring his work, and you'll see from his presentation, is a strong understanding of urban quality and the rich relationship between people structure and are placed within a, um, uh, a regional uh, sustainable urbanism. Please welcome Peter Richards. Mainly while I'm here, um, and I do want to acknowledge the support of the QUT in sending me here, it's been terrific. So by way of introduction, um, uh, I was at the airport with my wife about to fly to uh, Miami. I got a phone call from the marketing agent of one of my clients who uh, I've just been filming on a green screen a commentary about one of the projects that I'll show later on today. And uh, he said, everything was great with the audio, but my client had re rejected what you looked like. Your shirt was, you didn't look like a designer. You sounded like, so I'm not wearing that shirt today. I'm wearing a different shirt and hopefully I'll look more like a designer, maybe sound like a designer too, who knows. Subtropical urbanism, I mean, in the program, the topic, I've, I've shifted it slightly, partly due to coming in early in the conference, um, and I thought I'd talk a bit about South East Queensland and how we see ourselves and how that has shaped our view of subtropical design and subtropical urbanism. Um, but I like the notion of through the looking glass as an idea, 
I also like the notion that there might be Mad Hatters and Alice and strange queens and funny animals and things too. I quite, quite sort of warm to that notion of the collection of interesting people and interesting ideas about things. Because in many ways the looking glass is useful because it's, to me, it's how you see things. And one of the things that intrigues me is, um, yes, subtropical design is based around kind of facts of climate and things, which is changing as we know. Um, but also it's based on how we see ourselves and I think that's one of the messages that will come through. So this is a sort of a personal reflection on how notions of subtrop subtropical design, designing for place, um, informs the work that we've done in the office. So I'll talk a bit about subtropicality, a bit about urbanism and a bit about subtropical urbanism as we run through. And it's always good to show the shot on the right. I was actually in this room three years ago and I think I used this image on the right. Um, you probably can't read it too well but surface paradise this is an ad from Miami Keys at the Gold Coast. This is the Gold Coast near Brisbane, uh, Rio Vistas, and I think it actually says somewhere in here, Australia's first purpose-built Florida style, something or other, something or other. So we come across the world, we don't go very far. Uh, we're 27 degrees north, we're from 27 south, for those that aren't too familiar with uh, where South East Queensland sits, is the dot on the, uh, the middle of Australia on the eastern side. And here are some pictures of Brisbane. Um, you've probably heard of the floods we've had recently, and so this is the river in a slightly less um, flood-prone uh, aesthetic. Um, but it's quite a beautiful city, a fantastic river. Um, the CBD there, it's a million people in a region of three million growing to four million. It has been one of the fastest growing parts of Australia. And uh, the pressures of growth, which John Todd mentioned yesterday about subtropical coastal regions is very, very pertinent in, um, in our experience. And a lot of our work actually is how we accommodate that kind of growth in hopefully more sustainable forms. Uh, the bottom shot is a picture from my street. Um, it's not from my house. I live at the bottom of the hill where the architects live. This is the, do this is the house where the doctors live. Um, but it, it's a great view of the city. Um, and we'll talk a bit about topography and landform and vegetation. But also it underscores, you know, this is 4Ks from the middle of town. What's that? Two and a half, three miles maybe? 5K. Uh, the fact that we have a very pronounced CBD with tall buildings and nothing else. It's very different in this part of the world where there's lots of tall buildings everywhere. Um, and in a very close proximity to the city, you do get a whole range of quite beautiful little timber houses sitting amongst the trees on down, down the hill slopes. So that gives you a bit of a feeling of Brisbane and where we're coming from. <clears throat> when I think of subtropical design, um, I think about these sorts of things. I, this, I was in, a, in North Queensland at a rainforest centre and I've never seen this before so I photographed it and it's not very good quality pictures but um, it's classifying climatic types based on the sorts of vegetation and rainforest. So you can see, and I'm not a horticulturalist or a, so I can't tell you the names of all these plants and the like but you can see that they've carefully drawn each one of these things out so we get a tropical, um, that's more of a wet tropical we do have a savanna tropical climate in um, parts of, you know, this is more Cairns, dry tropical is more Darwin and Townsville. We have subtropical around southeast Queensland stretching further south and a, and a bit further north, going down to warm temperate and then cool temperate environments. And what's interesting, and one of the questions I'm often asked by people is saying, well, subtropical, yes, so how is that different to anything else? And in some ways, to me, that's not the right question, and hopefully I'll answer that as we go through this talk. But I have tried to sort of classify a very simple thing about where the sun in the sky is. We know that the sun is low in the sky, um, further from the equator and higher in the sky, closer to the equator. Uh, so these are the midday sun angles for different conditions, a veranda condition and a house condition. And this is trying to understand how you might treat a veranda in a dry tropical place compared to subtropical. And you can see that the veranda is getting pushed into the building through here. But Having now done a bit more work in the dry tropical and these areas, the veranda being pushed into the building and wrapping around it is useful too. So I'm throwing this away. But nonetheless, it was an effort to, um, it sharpens your thinking to say, well, this is subtropical. What is a dry tropical? How would we be different if you were designing in different regions? And I have the, the pleasure of working in these climates, well, probably Melbourne, um, southeast Queensland, uh, Darwin, um, uh, Cairns. So, you know, I'm often thinking about what, you know, how would the buildings be different, how would the streets be different in these different places. The other thing I really like about subtropical design is the sense of, it's the looking glass idea in the lens. Um, jacaranda trees are very prevalent in, in Brisbane 
Um, they flower in October. It's exam time. Everybody knows it's exam time. Um, and it's part of our kind of culture and tradition. So when I first went to Santa Monica and saw jacarandas, I felt that you'd stolen our, our, our meaning of our indigenous idea. But then, of course, they're actually probably indigenous more to Buenos Aires in here. This is Grafton, um, planted by a crazy German who moved there and convinced the burghers of Grafton 120 years ago to plant every street with jacarandas. It's now a jac jacaranda festival. San Diego, you might recognize Pasadena and Santa Monica. And of course, the subtropical region of Bhutan. So a lot of this to me comes down to if we understand it as being relating to our place, other can, people can have that same understanding to their place as well. It doesn't mean that they can't have it. Um, if jacaranda is part of our identity, part of our cultural landscape, um, the fact that Grafton and other places, and maybe, maybe Bhutan has a jacaranda festival, who knows, and, and good luck to them if they do. So we're obviously interested in the notion of responsive to climate. That's, that's a given, that's fine. Um, the centre has talked a lot about openness in relationship to nature and landscape, and that's all fine, and that has issues about um, urbanism, which I'll, I'll come to. <coughs> uh, locally recognisable distinctiveness, and that, I think, comes down to sense of place um, in, the, uh, in the area where you are. But as I've sort of pointed out, I suppose, is it a series of irrefutable truths that I'll tell you these are the four, three key things. Um, the notion of uniqueness and being distinctly different. Um, the magic dust, the magic bullet, that's the, that's the bullet that killed JFK for those you probably... In, in America, this is a, a probably very easy, everyone knows this image, I suppose, of the, the tract of the bullet coming through. But, but sometimes I think people are looking for, you know, what is the key, you know, what are the two, three things I've got to do? And to me, it's a bit more subtle, a bit more complex than that. Uh, the notion of the, the lens changing perceptions of our view of a space. Um, rose-coloured glasses. But in fact, subtropical design has captured the imagination of South East Queensland. It has constructed the centre, um, which was an initiative by the, um, the local government um, in 2003 or four, And certainly, as part of the aspiration for Brisbane City Council is the one that's a, a city designed for subtropical living. And that's in the, the goals and aspiration statements of the, uh, of the place. So in a way, it's kind of our brand um, I can use the word style in the States because you have no hang-ups with it as much as Australians do. But uh, <clears throat> I can see the Australians squirming in their chairs now, if I say the word, especially Rosie saying the word style. And one of the other debates I've had with some of my colleagues is, um, is subtropical design something that's self-conscious or does it just happen if you do things well? So if you just design for climate and place and all those sort of things, what you get is subtropical design or is it something that can actually direct your thinking and inform you about how you see the world? And often it's the, those that look at sustainable design as um, in buildings, and often it's to do with passive design and orientation. Um, and, and Peter Skinner, who's not here, who's a, who's a very good architect, uh, lecturer at the University of Queensland and president of the Institute, um, has often said since 2006 he's an orientation and dirt Nazi, meaning he likes small footprint buildings and everything's got to face north or south, and if you face west that's very bad. <coughs> so subtropical urbanism, good urbanism is a tropical place. But I think it does direct and inform our actions. Um, I think it's about a world view about how we understand ourselves. That doesn't mean it's arbitrary, but certainly um, it's part of a cultural um, agreement, I think, that can capture our imagination. And uh, I really like this. It's probably hard to see from the back there, but they, they sell little tie pins in the shape of the river. That's, an, that's a, a pre-flood river. It might be interesting to do a flood one as well, just to... Because the river is usually our friend, but it, can, it, it bit very hard in January this year, as you probably saw on the television. Oops, stealing my thunder here. So the issue of urbanism, um, subtropical urbanism to me is not collections of well-designed subtropical buildings in a subtropical landscape. And I think that could be quite an unurban and anti-urban kind of idea. I think there's some issues about urbanism um, which conflict and struggle in some ways with, um, with uh, orientation and for, for buildings, which we'll talk about. Uh, one of my favourite images, I assume this is a post-Hurricane Katrina um, FEMA camp trailer court at Gulfport, Louisiana. Um, and I look at it and think, well, here is the, in, the typical design of every building is oriented correctly. I bet the angles relate to breeze control. Um, I'm sure it, it, uh, they, all, they all face the right way, the angle for breezes, no doubt. Um, it has a strong relationship to landscape, even though there's no trees there, but you can imagine over time these trees could grow up. 
So to me, that's not the answer. Um, you know, and if you just focus on buildings and orientation, the sort of outcomes you might get are, are these sorts of things here. It's not, it's not urbanism in my view. And it's underscored by one of my favourite um, camping sites. This is in Norway, as it turns out. Um, I've done a study of camping sites in Norway. It's one of my uh, weaknesses. But, uh, but it's quite interesting. Um, when we learnt good passive design at uni, we, we, we layer the building towards the sun. The sun is this way, so we have the living spaces, the sleeping and service spaces, and maybe the car spaces at the rear, and this person's looking towards the sun. Um, and so, what, and like the, the, the Gulf Port in Louisiana idea, you then repeat them ad infinitum. And here, I'm sure modernists in the room will be aware of Ludwig Hilbersheimer's 1940 something diagrams about the new city and um, spacing um, apartments and towers based on sun penetration. I'm not saying that's wrong, and I'm saying we have to be aware of those sorts of things, but if we take that as the magic bullet, I think it can lead to some quite strange outcomes. Because what intrigues me about this campsite is um, that's actually a doctored image. That's the image there. She's actually facing that way. This thing here disobeys the rules of orientation. It puts the living spaces away from the sun. It puts, you can tell the sun's that way because people face the sun. And I've noticed in Florida that people sit on the beach and face the sun as well. In Australia, you face the water. You don't face the sun. Maybe the sun's worse in Australia. Who knows? But nonetheless, so she's looking this way. But all of a sudden, the fact that we create some kind of street um, there's a relationship between buildings facing streets, very simple notions of urbanism, um, and, but not just spatial definition, but the, the potential interrelationship. Um, and then all of a sudden there becomes a, a social life beyond the individual. Um, so you might have tables and chairs and you sit and talk and meet with people and things like that. So I found that very intriguing to observe that and, and see people having a holiday and enjoying themselves in a sort of a quasi-urban tent-like environment. And this topic I talked about at the conference at the Gold Coast, um, there's the well-known urban designer Katy Perry, you probably know. Um, I changed the words of the song, I Kissed a Girl, about, uh, I was pilloried by Peter Skinner for facing the subtropical row house that we had designed to the west. It did actually face the street, very bad. It did actually face the riparian corridor across the street, very bad. Um, it didn't face north. So it's those sorts of debates um, and, you know, we designed the building with verandas and sl sliding shutters and I, I felt that we could deal with the, uh, the western sun and also the vegetation across the road would, would help with the lower, the lower sun in the afternoons. But, uh, so the whole idea of orientation versus urbanism sort of came to the fore during that, present, during that time and that uh, conference presentation. And I made the point, as I said, I'm not opposed to orientation as a concept, that's fine, but I'm actually a supporter of urbanism um, and uh, urbanism is... Uh, uh, is very important because in the end we're trying to create urban places I think um, and then after the talk one of my friends came and said that was a great idea with Katy Perry he said you picked a song about orientation and I hadn't kind of got that other meaning we'll come back to South East Queensland South East Queensland is dominated by, by mountains and I, I've been, having been to Florida before um, this is probably the highest point I've been in Florida in this building second highest point was probably the uh, the I-95 overpass at uh, Golden Glades, the third highest point was room 920 at the Dolano the other night, which, uh, the other day when I had a bit of a tour from one of the, uh, the concierges down there. But I really like these images. These are maps. They're three-dimensional plastic maps made in Italy. Um, and this is 1980, southeast Queensland. So in the short term, I think we go... This is the urban footprint now. So we have urban footprints, we have growth boundaries. I know that's a, a, an interesting issue in this part of the world. In some places it's supported, in some places not. But you can see just from 1980 to the regional plan in 2005, that changed. Now those that watch the news on, uh, on, on television about the floods, just quickly to say that's Toowoomba um, on the mountain range and, and it drains down this valley here. So this is the Lockyer Valley and so the towns that got wiped out were these ones through here and this feeds down into here and it meets up with Wyvernhoe Dam, that's the Wyvernhoe catchment. The water comes down there and we've got this big, I think it's this one here, which is the Bremer River. So these are the three big river systems that came in and in a confluence to really cause the damage that happened in, um, in South East Queensland. And you can see in Brisbane, you can see that the, uh, the urban footprint then is on the land that's not as steep, obviously. So we're, we're basically filling up our, our valleys. So we're actually building sort of in the floodplain and keeping the hills nice. So if you start to diagram that, I did this some time ago and, and 
in ter terms of distinctness and place identity and the fact that the mountains is our backdrop, the coast is our sort of foreground, I suppose. We live between, between those two and some local authorities actually use the term between the green and the gold as a, as a slogan for their place in the world. That's more the Gold Coast down through here. But if you chart, and this is a very crude drawing, done before I could do Photoshop very well, um, showing all the mountain ranges and the valleys, you can again see the Lockyer Valley, which is the, the food basket for South East Queensland, the Wyvernhoe Dam, the Bremer River valleys coming in through there. But a lot of the places in, in South East Queensland are actually named after the rivers. Brisbane is named after the Brisbane River. Noosa, the Noosa River, Maroochee, so Noosa's up here, Maroochee, Caloundra, um, the, sorry, the Caboolture River, the Pine Rivers, the Brisbane, the Logan, the Albert, the Coomera. So, you know, the way we understand and name the place in South East Queensland actually comes from the response to topography of water going from the, uh, the mountains to the coast. I find that really quite uh, exciting. If you zoom in a little bit more, these were just trying to say, what is the landscape definition of South East Queensland? Um, we've got some um, koala areas, we've got mountains with inside, we've got green forests, we've got um, Spring Mountain, uh, Mount Cutha comes all the way down and touches the city in through here, the Boondall wetland. So, uh, and this was about trying to map, you know, and in fact, my conclusion was that Bulimba Creek and the Pine Rivers were actually the boundaries of Brisbane. Perceptually, when you cross them, you started to shift. So I was looking at how we might see landscape and how we know where we are within a place based on sort of changes in um, landscape and experiencing landscape, crossing rivers and the like. Now, there's a lot of debate about urbanism at the moment, as there always is, and these are two quotes which I come back to all the time um, as uh, using urbanism as part of a more sustainable future. And David Enwick actually is from Brisbane, although he's now well-known through the world. I'm not sure whether you've heard of him here. Anyone heard of him here? No? Okay. Uh, Neighbourhoods and towns, neighbourhood towns and cities were invented to facilitate exchange. Information, friendship, material goods, culture, insights, skills exchange of emotional, psychological, spiritual support. You know, we must maximise exchange while minimising the travel ne necessary to do it. Um, and that's a real challenge for us in South East Queensland, and dare I say, probably even a bigger challenge for you in uh, South Florida, perhaps, having experienced your 14-lane freeway two days ago. The other point is, and I really want to find the person that wrote this quote, I'm going because I made it up myself, and I'm, I'm sure someone else has said it is more important than I am. Uh, and this is Oslo, for those that uh, um, recognise it. Um, the fact that in urbanism we're trying to create the private lives for people in terms of where they, where they live, where they might work and those sorts of things. But it's critical that we actually frame the community life of, of, of a community um, and the proximity and relationship of elements that underpin the community, public buildings and, and the like is really critical in terms of um, creating distinctiveness, legibility and meaning. And for those that have been to Oslo, um, you'll probably know where all these buildings are. We have the new opera, remarkable building, the railway station, the castle. We have the uh, Oslo City Hall where they give out the Nobel Peace Prize. There's actually the Nobel Peace Prize Museum there. I missed that one out. There's the, uh, the, the Norwegian Parliament, the High Court, the University, the National Theatre. So, and the church where the... Uh, the king gets married and those sorts of things. So I'll come to Oslo later on with a plan, but basically, and I know that most times you don't design capital cities of nations. Uh, most of urban design projects are slightly less ambitious. But nonetheless, the way that we uh, both reflect cultural aspirations through public buildings and public institutions and how they inter in, uh, uh, are located within places is really very important and fundamental. So we'll come back to South East Queensland, and we have a regional plan and we have an infrastructure plan which actually spells out the kinds of train, train lines and roads and other things that will be built. And it really does inform what we do. It has growth targets for each local council. I think there's 17 or 19 local councils in South East Queensland. And you can see, I think, the boundary of South East Queensland, also defined by topography, coming in through. And that's the state boundary between New South Wales and Queensland in through there. Um, so each local authority will have population targets for jobs and housing. Um, so all of a sudden, for example, a council called Moreton Bay Council will have to accommodate, or Marucci Council, 100,000 people in the next number of years. So all of a sudden, what does that mean? How do we do it? And the way that we do it in Australia, and I, I, I could be wrong, and if someone knows better, please tell me later on, is that um, we have dot thinking. 
Um, now you've got lots of dots in this part of the world, it seems to me, and dots basically are centres. Our planning system regulates retail, commercial floor space. Uh, it's not possible really to build, except at an airport, build a shopping centre outside of a, of a centre. And there's usually a lot of con contention and contested terrain about where are the dots. Now these dots relate to existing centres in South East Queensland, um, and some are higher and some are lower order centres. There are different colours. You have grey ones, which is the main CBD. You've got red ones, which are, I can't read that through here, but um, primary act regional activity centres and major activity centres and then more localised ones. And then below that, again, are a whole series of other smaller centres which are then part of the more localised planning. So we're really focused on centres as centres as being parts of and foci of, of urban endeavour. And uh, so um, <coughs> the blue dot, it's called the blue dot. Um, there's always public transport with blue dots and in fact some of the blue dots happen because there is public transport and that's a really important thing about our, our projects and the work we do is that where there is public transport all of a sudden there's actually imperatives by government and also interest by the private sector to in fact do more intense developments in these places and mixed use. Um, and as I said we prescribe retail amounts and the notion of a, of a centre, then, there's a notion of catchment. Now, people will walk 10 minutes to catch a big train to go somewhere. Most people walk about five minutes to do, to do something. So that's the 400 metre circle, which is a big part of new, new urbanist thought. Um, so the notion of a polycentric region with a network of centres is really strong in the way we understand ourselves in terms of urbanism. Um, and for those that are aware of Clarence Perry, I won't go into him now, we find him quite irrelevant and don't know why. The US seems to like him so much. Another, that's another talk another time. So the way that uh, I think, this is the way I explain to people about the notion of centres and catchments and hierarchies of centres, and I'll talk about this project a bit later on as well. We now know how to map very easily um, water courses and floodlines. Most of Brisbane ignored these water courses and floodlines. They just draped grids over the hills and went up and down, and that's a big part of our character, but now we, we can't do that. You can see the water courses through the site. This is a ridge line, it's a water catchment for a, a dam. We've got some existing community facilities, schools and the like through there. So we can map that very easily and preserve that. This is vegetation that's to be kept um, in through here, vegetation protection. So what we can do now is we're getting better at carpeting the landscape with better quality housing. That's the light pink. Light pink's our sort of housing colour. It's a bit different colour on the screen there. Um, and there's lots of new projects now with rainwater tanks and solar collectors and double pipe systems and doing all those nice sustainability things but still it still is effectively you know suburban type sprawl. Um, you might find a centre located somewhere and I'll talk about where that is later on but often when this is sprawly stuff there's usually a green line around that meaning you can't in fact walk from there to there this is some kind of um, separate world that relates to the street network rather than the housing in the area. So if you then say let's cluster a series of neighbourhoods on these places and by doing so we can create some smaller centres. By creating smaller centres we can then um, create some other densities around those centres. They can then be public transport stops as they might come down and feed through into the, into the road network. Some of these centres might be placed on green corridors because uh, there's amenity there but also there's also potentially two streets that join there and that, that's fine as well. But the critical aspect is the transformation of the place when you actually conceive it as having a major centre somewhere. So this was a, a design for 15,000 people and about 9,000 jobs we did in 2004-05. It's called Rochdale. It's the structure plan for, for this area for the local council. Um, and just to say, the orange is the mixed use colour, pale blue is more employment. This is the primary retail focus. Um, community is, is yellow. So that builds up the different layers. So the argument is that without with series of neighbourhoods, that's fine, we can do that, but in fact with the town centre serving this region, we can in fact get some potential employment and other things and make the place more um, self-contained if possible. So what that then comes down to is we have the dots on the big plans, we have new developments with centres and, and, and smaller centres, um, and the state government commissioned a, uh, a document called Todd Guidelines, and it was about how you might develop and you can get it off the web, um, how you might develop design principles around Todd's. And we bid for the job and didn't get it. Um, someone else got it, but we ended up assisting with a few things later on. 
And one of the things that I identified is the notion of place typologies, and that was the sort of the theme of the talk as it started before I shifted it slightly for this morning presentation. And that we have CBDs, activity centres, and if you think about it, that's a range of densities. A specialist activity centre is probably a university-based centre. I'm not exactly sure which activity that one might be, but neighbourhood type suburban centres and urban centres. And then you can start to have a list of criteria down the left-hand side there about what is the land use mix, what is potential building height, plot ratio. Um, and by having a table, you can then start to see, well, what's an urban centre like instead of a neighbourhood centre and the like. So we did some cross-sections. I was quite pleased with those, but they didn't include those in the final document, which was disappointing. But it's just a way to show the different scales. The lines might be five-storey increments. Uh, you might have... I mean, you've got some very tall residential buildings um, in this part of the world and also office buildings as well, so I think that's probably close to four to 30 or 40 storeys maybe, rather than 60 or 70. Um, <coughs> and I won't go through this in detail. If, if people want copies of it, you're, you're most welcome. But uh, I found this really quite interesting to do. You know, the plot ratio is the amount of development area per site. You probably have a similar concept through here. So you've got one, two, three, two, three, five plus the general densities you might get around these places, and this is also the catchments around them. So it starts to say, well, if you've got a suburban centre, you can actually go to a plot ratio soon. You can maybe go up to 10 storeys in certain suburban centres, five storeys in neighbourhood centres. Now, these sorts of numbers are very, really quite... Five years ago, you'd been marched out of the room to, um, to if you'd suggested five storeys in a suburban, suburban type scale of centre. And then the land use mix at the bottom what this doesn't have is the quantum of, of area in these places, and uh, that's another exercise as well, but um, how many jobs in the CBD, what's the retail floor space? Um, percentages don't mean a great deal because, you know, this is probably X square metres, or that's probably 35 X square metres. But nonetheless, it's a useful table, and, and these figures are in, the, um, are in the Todd guidelines. There's also, um, through here, parking ratios, very contentious and... Uh, uh, dare I say, I've seen some buildings here that have more car parking podium than building, um, which is pretty interesting. But the, the private sector actually is embracing less parking around transit as well, because I see that as a measure of affordability, and they don't find it some um, detracting from potential sales. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the parking ratios are in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, but CBD, um, 0.75 to 0.5, um, you know, it's one space for 400 square metres or one space for... 250 square metres rather than one space for, say, 30 square metres. So if you then combine that, and this has not finished this work, it's, um, the, st it's the start, and actually when you start to map these out, this is trying to map out these types through here, spatially, um, both in terms of distances from, say, a CBD, 5K, 10K, 15K, um, public transport networks and the like. Now, to me, this is very important because if you understand urbanism in a place, you need to understand what the place is in relation to other places and an idea about the way you strategically think about regions and how one place might feed in and be part and link with other places I think is really quite important. But what that all means is one thing, taller buildings basically. Um, Brisbane has population targets, 145,000 more households I think, which is a significant amount and the only solution is to, is to go up. Um, and until recently, um, you know, as I said, 10 floors outside the CBD might have been entertained in certain areas, but it's all changing now. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Nonetheless, places like Alderley, which is a, on a railway line on a hill with views of the city, probably about six, seven k's, five miles from the, the centre of Brisbane, six miles maybe, um, has a 14-storey project, yet the community's up in arms about it. Um, and, uh, and the issue is that the planning is not catching up with the policy it takes time for the town plans to come through after the policy is made. And so private sector developments are becoming, you know, the community lags behind policy and this does the planning. But as you can see, you know, mayor backs more high rise for Brisbane. You know, what choice is there? OK, just to change tack slightly, and I'll check my time. I'm running out of time very quickly. Uh, we've had the, the privilege of working on, I think, some of the most significant urban projects in South East Queensland, um, um, we've had to work hard to um, beat our colleagues to get the work, as you do in a competitive uh, uh, consulting environment. But, uh, and I've got two purposes for this. One is to raise a, a few points, but also to give a flavour for those that don't know South East Queensland, the kinds of things that are going on. 
So if we go to the north, we have Sippy Downs Town Centre, the Sunshine Coast Hospital Master Plan and the Quina Town Centre. And Sippy Downs Town Centre is a new university in a greenfield and we've been trying for, for 11 years and failing. The buildings that are built are the yellow ones, trying to get this white stuff to get built and actually say to the university, build on your part of the site that actually starts to link in with the private sector land up in the top corner through there. Very challenging. The Sunshine Coast Hospital Master Plan, trying to break down a large institution into a more urban form and, and character, and the main town centres across the street that way. Uh, as we come down the Moreton Bay Rail Link, there's a new train line proposed from here, linking those two dots back to these dots and back into Brisbane, and that's the Kippering um, plan, which is the, the blue dot at the end of the line through there. And the council there sees the, uh, the rail public transport as the transformative piece of infrastructure to transform their, their region. Um, the actual ability to develop around the stations is possible, certainly more at Kippering, but nonetheless they see rail as a critical part of their future rather than not, and I believe that might not be the case in this part of the world. Um, in more urban areas, we've got Bowen Hills, which is a, a tod on top of a major station. We've got uh, Portside, which is in here. It's a precinct on the river of tall, very tall, high-dense buildings. Wyndham Central, Wollongabba is where we play cricket and uh, soccer and other things. Sorry, AFL and cricket. Uh, Yurong Pili is a new area owned of land owned by government near the river, which is, if you can see the red dot, it's on the uh, the far right and through here. Rochdale is next to it through there. Um, urban community in that location. Springfield is a new city, privately developed by a family company. Um, the train was announced to come to Springfield um, a week and a half ago. Um, we've been working with them trying to develop what they call Health City. And again, this is a, a hospital trying to integrate and catalyse a new urban precinct. Unfortunately, it's about 800 metres from the station, but there's a bus route that directly, directly feeds it. And their aspiration for the hospital is a bit bigger than I think they'll achieve in the next 20 years. But nonetheless, I, uh, my hat tips to them for their ambition. And then the Varsity Project, which I presented in this room three years ago, which is down through here. So as you can see, the projects relate a lot to public transport infrastructure as a catalyst for them occurring. The identification of places as centres and mixed-use centres and intensifying land uses. Um, and uh, developing sort of sites that this is a vacant site effectively, a research institute, um, and then doing urban infill on effectively brownfill sites. So to quickly run through these, and Rosie, just start haranguing me if I'm, there should be some time for questions. Varsity, <coughs> you won't recognise the landform, very similar to uh, California, so, sorry, southern Florida. Yeah, oh, well, I need more than that, that's okay. Um, Station on site on the highway, I'll go through this very quickly. The aspiration was, for, of course, for park and ride, so you design the place to get there easily by car so you can leave it and go somewhere else. Um, we analysed the centres again. Um, this site is in through here. You can see it's not very far from Miami, which is just there, um, coming through. It's on the hinterland coming to the Gold Coast. The plan itself um, is the way this is... So orange relates to housing and, and retail mixed use. Blue is probably more employment. Um, certainly getting employment regionally located on public transport is a big part of the, the land use mix. Um, more residential tucked in down through here. Um, the railway station is here and the park and ride for 300 cars is there. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. But this is the, the plan as it finally occurred and we worked very hard to try to make that an urban corner. And you can see there's a, you know, we've got funny cranks and streets and um, so we get the street coming down and terminating the vista in the station and then looking through to the hills behind. We have the buses in this street here set back from the train with buildings so we get spatial containment. This light's fading. Um, so what, and the, and the message of this part of it is in terms of places is that urbanism we need to create. Um, uh, one of the issues we have, in, in, I suppose, in, in many areas, including here, the notion of endless space. And urbanism is about defining space and creating space. But in terms of a subtropical environment, the nature is never far away. So if you can combine nature with urbanism and con urban containment with vistas to green, clearly is a, is a key part of what we're <coughs> trying to achieve. So we convinced them to put the park and ride here and leave a 40 by 40 site for development to terminate that vista. Um, the scale of buildings is about that height, 12 storeys. Peter Edgeley, very fine um, renderer. Um, so... This is the bus street, the station precinct. This is looking down um, 
through here towards this building, which is that building in there. Uh, and the bottom right one is the shot looking down the main street, looking towards the station. The station is now built and it's got some architectural awards um, and good luck to them. And the Todd looks a little bit like that. So it's got all the simple things of creating streets and public spaces, um, trying to uh, create legible environments. You know, that is the main focus through here. There's another public square up in this area as this comes through. It links in with the park, which then links across towards Waterway. So the people who live in the housing that's just been built can actually get an access to Todd. And what's exciting is that you can actually start to see, well, there's the plan we drew some years ago, and now it's, it's built. And when you go there, it's quite interesting. It, it actually feels like it's a place waiting to happen. You drive down the street, and you get to this corner, and it's all designed in an urban sense. There's street trees. You know, it's like, you know, just where are the buildings? And with the GFC, it slowed things down a bit. But uh, it's an exciting project, and uh, one I think that will come to fruition at some point soon. Quickly run through Yurongpilly and Bowen Hills. Yurongpilly is to the south on the river Bowen Hills to the north. I won't go through the detail of these, but in terms of urban design process, we need to analyse the site and explain key things. There's a flood line, which I won't go into yet, because this site did flood fairly badly, and they're now reviewing the work that we've been doing. Um, it's next to the major tennis centre for the region, and next to a major train station. There's a new train line to be built underground from here towards the city. So this will be probably 10 minutes um, access to the city on a fast train at probably five or more minute headways you know, in the future at some point. So certainly getting density and a range of uses there is seen as a very useful, useful thing. There's some recent developments on the river which actually flooded fairly badly. The site's an Animal Research Institute. There's some historic buildings on the site. And the structure plan ends up being a little bit like that. Um, we've kept heritage buildings in through here. Um, there's a heritage building in through there. We've created a series of spaces, um, both green, urban spaces and green spaces that link through. We've got this armature that comes through into the river. This is the walkway through the, to the tennis centre from the station. We get 90% public transport use or more to get to um, major sporting events in Queensland, which is pretty amazing. Um, the main retail commercial uses are through here. Office, some offices in through there. And then a gradation of housing types, um, taller at the rear and lower at the front. And that's the illustrative plan in an early stage as it's starting to emerge, coming through probably 800 to 900 houses and um, five, 6,000 square metres, maybe 10,000 of office. Um, but I guess the message here is that in terms of a subtropical urbanism, we are trying to create urban environments with close and spaces and, and defined active public spaces, but also the opportunity to use to bring in green fingers and green links through the project. Uh, this is both in terms of some flooding, but also recreation, the community sees this as a hub for themselves in the surrounding area um, as a place to come. Um, we've done a few little studies in SketchUp of getting a sense of the feeling of scale and trying to suggest balcony access apartment for cross ventilation of up to seven storeys um, coming through and what those densities might be like. Um, major urban blocks with supermarkets in, um, incorporated into the middle, holes through buildings and so these, are, these aren't really designed as much, but gestures of things that might be working. But, you know, the notion of balconies and shutters and prominent roofs are all things that, that feed in, I think, quite comfortably with a subtropical urban architectural sort of feel. The other thing that we've doing a lot of work on are row houses, which are these little, these little things here, two and three storey. Um, you can build those in Australia for about a third of the cost of an apartment building. You build apartments cheaper here, uh, it seems to me, than we can in Australia. Apartments in Australia would be two and a half thousand dollars a square metre, whereas we can build these for closer to a thousand or a bit less if we're lucky. So that's seen as an affordable way to get density, and they often come in you know, four, five, six, up to nine metre wide um, increments. <coughs> Very quickly, Bowen Hills. Um, in an urban brownfield site, um, these colours represent barrier spaces. The red is a, as a Montpellier Hill. Um, the purple on the bottom right and the top right are more industrial areas. The blue is the um, showgrounds. The brown is the railway yards. We've got some heritage buildings and recent public housing that's been built. We've got impacts from very busy roads, bypasses. The purple line is the new overbridge from a, a road tunnel from the airport called the Airport Link that feeds in through the site. The yellow line is potential overhead busway. Uh, the access points and the public existing streets there's only two or three ways to get into the site to create a network of access in 
Um, there's also a potential railway station under here, which never quite happened. So in the end, <coughs> these things, then, then there's potential views to the hilltop and down streets coming out. So these are the things that then inform what this plan might be as a very high dense urban place. And the heights of these buildings grow, grew every time we did a plan. You can see the uh, beautiful bit of um, US inspired sort of freeway system in through there. We haven't got much of this in Australia, um, but this is a really good, uh, our best example of trying to emulate the I-95 where it meets so-and-so coming through. Um, but this is a project where we had to start looking at what is a 30-storey building as a subtropical building, um, getting a sense of the scale of, you know, I actually put them in two nights ago in, in PowerPoint, the scale of buildings coming in through there. So this was the scale of the, of the place. Um, this is built over the train line as the public space and the entrance to the station is in through here. Um, views from balconies looking down towards the, um, this market building in through here. We also use these drawings as sort of like the coding type drawings with arrows and boxes showing key elements of the plan and features of the facade and the, the use of strong podium lines. Not setbacks but um, breaks in buildings with uh, balconies and recesses and towers and and places to put gardens and things through there. I know I've got to finish. I've got this one to go yet. <clears throat> I'll just quickly um, run through Rochdale, make it one point through here. Uh, this was the computer says no constraints plan that, com that the computer drew. This is the synthesised constraints plan by me. This is the environmental strategy for the site done through a workshop process. Um, and so this became the underpinning sort of frame for the urbanism with uh, green corridors, koala links and the like coming through. But the debate was where does the main centre go? If you believe in terms of this as a main centre than a supporting centres, does the main centre go in the centre of the project? Does it go in the most prominent place in the project? Um, usually at the entrance where the busiest roads are, where you can see it and get access to it. Do you put it where the existing centre already is? Do you put it in probably the busiest intersection within the project, which is there? Or do you put it in the place of the highest amenity? And uh, in the end, <coughs> it became in the place of the highest amenity. Um, so we then tried to say, what do buildings look like that would um, form these places and up to six storeys? But building footprints where there's deep planting, where there's cross ventilation, where there's an aggregation of elements and forms, um, the taller buildings closer to the trees rather than away from the trees to reward people for living in a slightly high dense environment by putting the centre in this location. We've, we've got green links and green fingers coming through, which is all very exciting. Um, again, scale of buildings, interfaces to busier streets, and then that becomes the main structure plan, which you saw before. But just finally, and I'll, I'll conclude soon, Rosie, so I'll, I'll just keep tapping your foot. Um, just with the geometry, one of the things about responding to water courses, they never go north, south, east, west, so there's always shifts of the geometry to utilise, which are a, a bit of fun to use. You can see the drainage line coming in through here. The street does that small crank. We've got that line in through there. So just picking up some of these geometries and um, shifting angles of vista, we can create a main town square facing due north. We can angle the, building, uh, the street to feed. This is a public building. Um, access into the supermarket, car parking in behind. Um, series of apartment buildings with row houses and the like coming in behind through there. This is the business precinct on the, the far side with the, the public building for that, which is like a convention conference meeting facility that has direct links back into the town centre. So crafting in certain places, as you're coming in, we've got contained vistas through here, but in those places you can stand here and you can get views directly out towards green through there. So the notion of urban containment plus prospect to, to green spaces, I think is a very nice part of the notion of relation to place. And these are the diagrams that we started to do to try to explain the, uh, the idea of uh, public buildings and the like. I call these prolly plans, it's my version of Nolly's famous plans. And the perspective, which I will redraw one day, but uh, just trying to show, you know, so we've got row houses and apartments, this is the supermarket, car parking, the, the public library, the, the town square, the other public building linking through. And we squeeze the corridor down to its narrowest at this point to get better access across and we compensate elsewhere for um, additional green. So to, you, to, to draw the projects I've talked about briefly, um, coming through the notion of of hearts, of places, of main streets, of, of key access points, of key infrastructure elements of, of um, freestanding buildings, of, of churches and of market halls and theatres and, and the like, the two heritage buildings in through here, the sports building. 
Um, these are the things that hopefully give some meaning and legibility and the way we organise those together um, is creating the urbanism that we're trying to achieve with these, these things. So just in conclusion, two observations. That all seems fair enough to me, but this is dear old Oslo, and in fact Oslo does exactly the same thing as I've just been talking about it. It's not a subtropical place, but it, it actually crafts vistas to its key institutions, like the castle and the station. It has some areas where you get vistas out towards the mountains and towards the water. So the question for me then is, is this just something about humanity and about containment and about openness that's a universal thing, but it resonates in a subtropical place? To me, that may be the case. Fingers and donuts are very important design philosophy. Um, the Sunshine Coast Hospital is based on narrow buildings. That's a very key part for getting light and breaking down the scale of large institutions is the Sunshine Coast Hospital. The ideas for the fingers and donuts, you can see the donuts are the service buildings, the fingers are the wards, and that's the, the, the uh, atrium open space through the middle. Actually came through a London architect based on projects in Norway. So the question is, um, you know, these things relate all over the place. Um, I think ideas resonate for different places um, at different, for different reasons, but certainly in a subtropical sense, I think these do make sense to me um, as being something that we can own and understand about our region. But at the same time, they do work with others and their region as well. There's the lens. Quiz, which one's the Australian flag? I can use this in this, this country. This is a trick question for those that do know Australia. But in the end, you know, none of these are the Australian flag, as you no doubt know. But in Australia, we have a debate about whether we change the flag or not. Now, I'm sure if that happened in the States, you'd probably get marched over to Mexico or worse, Guantanamo Bay or something. But uh, <coughs> in the end, we agree culturally about ourselves. And I think that's a key part of this whole nation and the, the idea that as we discuss our place, we need to have an engagement with the community and talk about things and ensure that there's an understanding of it and values that underpin it. Um, and that's why I think subtropical design is a very rich and nuanced term. Um, so we need to respond to climate, traditions, values. It can form our actions in a cultural context and landscape. Um, and it's got to capture our imagination. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter, for taking us on a whirlwind tour of the dots. Um, look, we're just about out of time, but if anyone does have one burning question, uh, we'll take that now before we go to coffee or tea. Um, otherwise, Peter will be with us throughout the conference and you can pin him down wherever we go. Um, so is there one burning issue that... Um, I think we might call that a no. And just in, just in the interest of keeping the, the conference um, on track, um, we're now having a coffee break and I believe there's coffee on level nine where the, the next three um, concurrent sessions will be. Um, but um, there's also coffee at the Innovations Cafe um, across the street. And please um, take advantage of that and uh, visit the uh, exhibitors as well and um, include them as, um, as strongly as possible within the conference. Uh, and um, hopefully just by looking at your program, um, you will be able to see where to go for the, the next session which commences again at 10.30 a.m. Thank you. Thanks once again to Peter for um, taking us on a whirlwind tour of the dots and certainly my mind is quite boggled with um, um, moving back and forth from Miami to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thanks. That's okay. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Good job. I want to ask. I was going to ask you a question about the public spaces. Yeah. Well, I'll take. I'll take a while we're taking a break. <laughs> the cultural aspect of public space, mm. courtyards and plazas, have to do with exchange. Or, so you're designing them in advance. How do you know where to position them? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you show, and the, because obviously, part oh. of the public plaza, the courtyard is part of, is an extension of the sidewalk that's publicly funded. 
Yep. You're designing in advance. Sure. Usually these things are centers of commerce exchange. Kind of well, yeah, it's true, but we, we are locating 